Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. We have reached the end of year C on November 20th, 2022. It is Reign of Christ Sunday or Christ the King Sunday. And the texts are these, Jeremiah 23, 1 through 6. We, for the psalm, are going to talk about Luke 1, 68 through 79. Psalm 46 is also an option. Colossians 1, 11 through 20. And Luke 23, 33 through 43. So we... Here we are. Uh, wow, here we are, the end of... Year C, hard to believe. And we do say this every year, but it's worth saying it again, that the this concept of the reign of Christ or Christ as king, uh, there, there are many, many things we could say about that. Uh, but I think what we, what at least I want to hold up is how each of these texts speaks to an aspect of that reign that can be upheld or put you know put a spotlight on and say what does what does what does it mean to call Jesus king what does Jesus kingship look like uh, what does what does what is called for it? in the reign of Christ, what is God's, what is Jesus' kingdom, what is it about? And so each of these texts, I think, really speaks differently to that. And so I would just, I, I, would, I want to say first to the preacher, only you know what your congregation either needs to hear or needs to be affirmed of or needs to be reminded of or sometime corrected by that, you know, they have this idea of what kingship is and wait a minute, this text is going to do a little bit of corrective on that. Uh, and so that's, that's the first, uh, the first thing I want to remind preachers of on a, on a Sunday like this, which we often say, but uh, per I think particularly around this Sunday because of the way in which the terminology has, there's so many assumptions with it. And there's, uh, when we talk about reign and king and, and what do we, what do we, what do we mean by that? And um, yeah, so that's my first, that's my first comment. I appreciate that this, this, this Sunday has gotten a bad rap in some circles in, in recent years. Some of that deserved, some maybe not. Uh, everybody knows what their congregation needs, like you said. Is the language of king and kingdom problematic because it's antiquated? Certainly. Is the language of king maybe adding one more or lifting up one more male title or image for God? Certainly. Does it reflect a kind of mimicry of imperial values or imperial shows of strength? Certainly. At the same time, I worry when we try to strip this notion of power away from God and the gospel. I cringe whenever somebody says kingdom instead of kingdom. And that's for a million reasons. And if you say it, that's fine. I won't make fun of you on this. But and I get what's behind that. I just don't think that kingdom is any less offensive to certain people, or any less problematic to certain people for different reasons. And the notion of, of power, and some of the texts will pull this up, I think is, is crucial if indeed the power of what God delivers us from is as strong and as prevalent as what the Bible says it is and what my experience with human nature suggests it is. In other words, we need a God who, you know, power isn't necessarily power to dominate over others. It's sometimes it's power to get things done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a kind of agency. And of course, all this needs to be parsed. And that's exactly what you were saying, I think, Caroline, about what do we mean by reign or king? And so I would say before we run too quickly from the language, I think that that's going to deliver us from the bigger task. Uh, it's, this is what preaching always is. It's trying to contextualize an old message, a sometimes weird message, and a message that's often uh, offensive in the ears of a lot of people for reasons the preacher can't possibly predict. 
on a given well, and what does Yeah, and what does it mean to, I mean, think about what sort of a, a kind of um, resistance kind of claim it is to say that, uh, uh, to say Christ the king and not somebody else the king or the reign of Christ and not the, 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 the kinds of reigns and the kinds of kingdoms and the kinds of claims of kingship that, that surround us and are so embedded in our, in our world. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I, I appreciate that, Matt, because I do think it's a claim. It, it is kind of a claim of resistance and saying, no, this is, this is, this is the kind of power and this is the kind of authority and this is the kind of kingdom to which I belong uh, and and to which I have uh, I have pledged my obedience and loyalty. And that's what I that's what I stand behind. And the death of Queen Elizabeth and now the reign of King Charles, uh, which for so many of us in our um living memory, um, the, the, the kingdom that we have talked about um, has been ruled by a queen. And so the impact of these words really does not seem uh, as relevant um, as they are in other places where the reigning monarch is a man, is a king, and some of those places less Christian than Great Britain. Um, and then on the other, on the other hand, um, what it means for us to be reintroduced to the whole idea of what will this modern, um, kingdom of England look like under this new leadership? And it might uh, behoove us as those questions are being asked in our global culture to revisit, as you said at the opening, um, what does it mean for us to say that we live in the reign of, of, of Christ? And yeah. we've lost that. And I think um, I, I totally agree with you, Matt, that the power dynamic is so critical to be lifted up, especially in the midst of all that we have had to deal with on the ground right now from uh, the crazy climate to the a uh, paralyzing pandemic to the polarizing politics to, you know, the lack of community, the list goes on. Those are pretty powerful. Yeah. And I need an image that can take that on. Yeah. Well, and the dangerous too, one thing I would add to that is nationalism, which ironically enough, I believe that this became a feast day almost a hundred years ago because the Pope at that time was trying to combat rampant nationalism in Europe at, after the end of World War I. Now, whether or not this was the right idea for doing that or whether or not it worked out the way that Pope wanted is certainly up for debate. I get that. And I recognize the power of this, but I am I am terrified by, by currents of Christian nationalism. I should say white Christian nationalism in this country right now. And we need to figure out how to, we, those who aren't in those camps need to figure out how to talk about the power of God in ways that are powerful and compelling and true that don't obviously that, that push back against that. Anyway, we probably made our case. In, in 1941, George Orwell said that the only way for us to understand the modern society is to understand the politics of it. He said it in 1941, and he went on to say that the reason that Mussolini was able to rise to power, uh, Hitler and Mussolini were able to rise to power, is because they understood that and the church did not. Yeah. So, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Should we begin there? So, of what anything to say to a guy on a cross? Down, but what an upside down moment of kingdom. Yeah, so I think to start there is just um, uh, what we've been talking about is just how countercultural in any moment this language is, whether we're refashioning kingdom or whether we're talking about an actual monarchy. 
Well, talking about the one who is killed by the empire offering paradise to um, someone who's being killed alongside of them, that's a pretty countercultural world without even going outside of the text. Right, right. Especially a guy who's got King of the Jews written over his head. And this is all part of, I think, a, a spectacle that Pilate has set up to basically say, look how pathetic this guy is. Look how pathetic the Jewish notion of kingdom and, and their own autonomy is. And somebody turns to him and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom is, 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 is it's laughable on the surface. And, and I think another stark contrast here is, is of course, the scene unique to Luke. And so that's, that's important to name as well. But that uh, one of the dominant terms in this passage is to save. Uh, he saved others, let him save himself, save yourself and us. And so it calls attention to the entirety of of the gospel of Luke and what salvation is and what salvation looks like. And we go back then, we have to go back then to Mary's vision of, of salvation, which is you look upon the lowly and you see the lowly, uh, you have regard and, and those whom you favor, uh, those whom you see, who God sees are, are with you in paradise. And so it could be really a, I think a beautiful and moving sermon to go back and and pull out this uh, that to say Jesus is King is to say you're saved. But what is that? It, it, salvation is present, and what, but then what does that mean? What does salvation really mean here? And that Jesus has the power to save, and of course that's a claim of a king or a claim of a of a ruler or a leader, uh, I can save you. I can save you. I can save you. And yet, uh, and yet to be, a, to be a part of God's kingdom, to be, uh, to commit yourself to this kingdom is also to commit yourself to a kind of salvation that, that we need to give voice to its particularity. Uh, and as a way of saying that this, this is different. And it's dependence on, the salvation of God made known in Christ. Because the anthem for Great Britain is the savior who is the king needs saving. God save the king. And again, that, that lifts up. Who, who is the one that ultimately we should put our faith and confidence? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, and to say that everything has to begin and end with with a text like this or with this scene. When I say everything, I mean everything that has to do with the, the confession: Christ is Lord, or in this case, Christ uh, has a, a kingdom to announce. Right? I mean, the the primary term that gets used in the synoptics for Jesus and his relationship to the kingdom is proclaiming. Mm -hmm which we tend to think of as just speech, but it's it's always woven in with these actions as well. The proclamation isn't just speech, but it's this embodied. Body. Brian Blunt used to speak about uh, erupting uh, with this idea of something just popping up and, you know, in bits and pieces here and there, or slowly coming to a boil and, and, and spilling over the, that kind of an image is really different from somebody whose kingship begins with coronation or something like that, for example, exactly. or that begins with respect, honor. I mean, this is the guy who tries to keep his, his identity secret through a lot of the synoptic plot and would rather proclaim what this reign, you know, is going to look like. So I think that's part of it too, in terms of thinking even narratively, how does this idea get developed? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then I, irony here is that he's put on full display and it's the observers who are claiming his true identity, you know, so that's just, right. there's all kinds right. of stuff there. Uh, Jeremiah? This is a little more blatant. <laughs> <laughs> Shepherd. Mm -hmm. But again, going, looking through the lens of what, how is it that each text speaks to what does the, mm -hmm. what is called for uh, in in as a leader in God's kingdom. And so a preacher might hear this. <laughs> uh, 
for themselves. But this law, this, uh, this longing for a just kingdom and that 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 inherent to Jesus kingdom God's kingdom not uh, is justice and righteousness mm-hmm. and uh, and that those are the qualities or those are, those are what identify uh, this reign over other reigns. And so if people are wondering, well, how do you, you know, how do we determine, uh, you know, who, who is really reigning from God or speaking from God or representative of God? Well, is there justice and righteousness? And if there's not, then this has nothing to do with God's kingdom, no. nothing to do with God's kingdom. And is so it divisive? is it divisive and scattering? Mm-hmm. It, then it has nothing to do yeah. with the kingdom yeah. of God. Yeah. Oh, that's. Well, I love the language too in verse four about the absence of fear, n- no more being dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. And so again, mm-hmm. to think about what is this rule? What is this reign? What does this oversight mm-hmm. look like? So you can pull some really interesting characteristics out of this text and illustrate them, especially with reference to current events with very little effort, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yes. There's a, there's the upside downness to this text as well, in terms of who would be named as the scatterers and who would be named as the good shepherd. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. The well, psalm. Which always is, nice to have a New Testament psalm in the mix. <laughs> yeah. Well, and again, unique to Luke, and so we're drawing on uh, drawing on our our year of Luke. But again, through that lens, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He has looked favorably on His people and redeemed them. That's what. Again, that's what marks the King <laughs> that is Jesus. You know, the King that is mm-hmm. God. That is is the one who looks favorably and redeems. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's what God's kingdom is about. That's what Jesus' kingdom is about. And of course, goes on with beautiful, beautiful language of, 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 of the, you know, of uh, the Benedictus. But, uh, but yeah, again, that the, the way in which this gives voice to the particularities of what, of the characteristics of what does it mean to um, to see God's kingdom to proclaim to proclaim kingdom yeah. of Christ? Mm-hmm. So it's not it's not the authoritative voice over, but it's the incarnate presence of one who forgives, one who restores, one who um, brings about righteousness in a way of peace. And who has the strength to deliver, I think. Mm-hmm. But the, in verse 69, it's the NRSV has mighty savior mm-hmm. there. It's literally horn of salvation. Mm-hmm. And the translators just destroy the metaphor for some reason. Mm-hmm. And not horn like trumpet, but horn like an animal's horn mm-hmm. is the, yeah. the Greek term there. So imagine, I don't know, Longhorn fans or all of our people in Texas or whoever, mm-hmm. you know, the, the horns of an animal being symbolic of the strength of an animal, what it does to do combat with, which, so you can play with that for a bit, right? Why would you need a savior like that? Well, it goes on about saving from enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Really dangerous language in the wrong hands. Yeah. And so how do we parse that? Or why do we, why does a savior need to show strength? Why does a deliverer need to have strength of some, I mean, it sounds like a stupid question, but I think it's worth toying around with um, because some people will say, well, you don't, that's just a dangerous image. There will be some people who will say, I was delivered out of something and I needed the strength of the law. I needed the strength of somebody. I needed literally somebody's bodily strength to pull me out of something. We'll have stories about that. And that's how we share those could be really interesting. Not that this is the only metaphor we need. I don't think any of us are saying that, but to continue to talk about what does a powerful God do with that power and toward what end? 
Mm-hmm. And what I'm does strength? Myself, perhaps, but go ahead. I'm sorry. No, but what does strength? And and actually, maybe that's a great lead into the Colossians text because uh, because we get that at the very beginning. May you be you made strong with all the strength that comes from His glorious power, and so the way in which then perhaps that this, you know, as you were saying, Matt, this, the strength of, and the power, it's dunamis, right? Dunami, uh, it's where we get dynamite. Uh, I used to be so excited to tell students that back in the day when I was teaching Greek, but, um, <clears throat> but maybe it's a helpful image, you know, it's like, <laughs> uh, but that, <clears throat> that, that, that strength, which I, to what extent, Persons in power uh, keep to themselves, right? That kind of strength and power that they that 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 they hold, and and yet what's identifying of God's power is empowering you. I mean, it it it's how does that how does God's strength, how does Jesus' strength flow out into becoming? Uh, becoming your strength, and so it's a giving of power and a giving of uh, a giving of that, uh, yeah, a giving of that power rather than rather than holding on to it, which is another sort of upside down sense of what God's kingdom is like. Mm-hmm. And, a, and another upside down is um, when you know that power or that strength is on your side your response is to be able to endure joyfully with patience, giving thanks to the one who is that power. Um, it's, it's very different than saying, I'm going to come out, um, um, I'm gonna come out like a raging bull because I know God is on my side. No, I know God is on my side and so I can be patient I can express joy. I can endure. I will give thanks. It's it's a topsy turvy way of responding to such great power in the midst of such great evil. Hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that a lot, especially around this text. There is it's such a rich text. There's so many things that cry out for explanation. You could dip into in the commentary note some of that as well. Like where do you even begin? really everything from verse 15 forward is more definitional, right? Mm-hmm. Who is Jesus? Mm-hmm. Image of the invisible God before all things, head of the body. I would say that for given the the setting, this, this particular Sunday, that we spend more time in verses 13 and 14, which are the effects mm-hmm. of who he is. This isn't maybe a day to define or, or to insist that Jesus deserves these titles and not those titles. This is a day to describe the effects of what this quote unquote reign looks like and it's deliverance over and over again. And what's remarkable about those effects is, is expressed then in verse 16 and following with the Mm -hmm. repeat of Pontas, right? All, 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 all. So that's the, that's the kind of strength and the kind of power we're talking about with the effects of, of God's, uh, of, of, of this kingdom of, of Jesus Christ is that it's for all and it, it extends into all and it's, it's all, and, and which, and that repetition of all makes it just almost, almost completely unimaginable. Uh, and that kind of reach and that kind of power, and it's the kind of power that, that so many people want, you know, power over all things over. and in all things. And yet, and yet, It's our God who is all in all.